All right, welcome to Engineering Basics number 11. This is Intermediate Statics part four. Um, yeah, we should, should be good to go. Okay, Intermediate Statics part four. So last time we covered, uh, we covered methods of suctions. So the time before that, we covered methods of joints. And all this is to talk about more complicated uh, more complicated stuff in statics. So, but before we started this intermediate statics thing, we could deal with one single thing. It might have had some forces or moments on it in random places. Now we can talk about structures. We can talk about, okay, we got a couple things that are attached to each other. Uh, maybe they're attached to each other in interesting ways, but you know, now we can either disassemble them at the joints or we can make a cut through them to talk about them. So today, uh, we're going to start to bridge the gap between statics and dynamics. Um, so a lot of times in the statics courses, well, in ME211 here at Cal Poly, um, you'll actually, at the end of statics, you start to talk about what we're going to talk about today, which is centers of mass, well, center centers of mass and of area and moments of inertia um i've decided to go ahead and clump in a couple other things to tack them on at the end um because really this is no longer this is no longer going to be focused on statics we're going to start jumping into dynamics land um so for the these topics are technically things that we can talk about without knowing anything about dynamics but uh, dynamics is where we start using them. So with that, can anyone tell me what is stress? Force over a distance. Also me right now. Force over a distance. I don't think that's quite right. Oh, area, over area, my bad. There we go. Force over area. That's, that's what I'm looking for. And what does that mean? So if a stress is a force applied over an area, what is that? What are we trying to talk about here? I mean, isn't it, sure it? Isn't it useful in determining what kind of material you need to have? Yeah, that's a good... And what your system has to be able to... I mean, you have to be able to provide enough force to counteract the stress. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's a really hard thing to define without using numbers. Um, and that's actually part of... Part of we'll, we'll get in, I'll get into this in a, a slide or two. But um, one of the really difficult things about engineering topics is they're just hard to describe without using the equations. So it's really hard to tell to just tell someone, well, what is stress? Um, the the best way that I've found to talk about stress is it's it is an object or a body or some material's resistance to having a force acted upon it, and then we divide that by the area, and it's sort of normalized by the area, just so that we can compare things of different sizes. So really, ultimately, at the end of the day, I would say stress is an uh, is a body's resistance to being acted upon for how much material there is. So, to that end, what is strain? Anybody? We had, we had some good definitions for stress. If I had to guess, I'd either say force over distance or force over volume. Not quite. So if, if we put a stress on something, it will experience a strain. So if we put a force on something, what do we expect it to do? Well, I remember we talked about strain was the ratio of the change in length over the original length that was caused by a force. Yeah, there you go. So a strain, and I, this is, uh, I, I wrote that backwards. That should be a, a weird E, not a three. <laughs> um, 
Next, it's a, an epsilon, or a lowercase epsilon. There we go. Um, so I would say that, uh, st that stress is to strain like force is to distance. Um, and that's that's very loose definition. But um, you can kind of think of this the same way. So uh, if something is straining, we're saying it's changing length, and then we divide it by the total length just to normalize it. So similarly with how, with how for stress we said it's a force over an area, we have some quantity that we can reasonably describe, but we want to be able to use this thing that we're talking about with respect to all types of materials. So we normalize it by the area. Um, so we can talk about it if it's a teeny tiny little pencil or if it's a, a massive backhoe, right? Same idea with strain. Uh, a strain is literally just a change in length. It's just this thing was this long, and now it's this long. We put it in compression. Or that long if we put it in tension. Um, and then we normalize it by some other thing so that we can t compare this value to something of a different material. Um, so the, the big idea with stress and strain is there are things that we kind of have a good conceptual understanding for, but we can now compare uh, apples to oranges, right? So with that being said, I have a philosophy on some engineering concepts um, that I think it needs some explaining. So a lot of engineering concepts are introduced in, in the idea of physics and math. So, you know, when you're, when you're looking at schools, when you're in high school, people say, oh, you're really good at math. I think you should be an engineer. Or, hey, you're really good at physics. I think you'd enjoy engineering. Um, but engineering is it's more than that, right? It, the idea is that we are describing how things work. We're describing what stuff does um, just using the tools of math. So it does us no good to say, well, this is force over area if that doesn't mean anything. Um, so to that end, uh, I'm going to present the, the next, I, I guess, topic, if you will. Um, all, all of these, all these things we're about to, to talk about from that point of view. So I'm going to try and present them as if these are actual physical, like representations of something that's happening rather than some convenient math tool. You could, you could give the argument that, well, stress isn't a real thing, right? There's no actual such, th there's not such a thing as stress. It's just, we put a force on an object, and that object has to ha happens to have some cross-sectional area, and we just combine those two things together to say, well, this is what we're calling stress. You could make the same argument for velocity, right? You could say, well, there's no real thing as velocity. We just have some thing, and it travels some distance over some amount of time, and we just take that distance and divide it by the time and say, well, that's the velocity. Now, in reality, right, velocity is something that we can actually comprehend. We can say, oh, that's going faster than that, or that's going slower than that. Uh, because we're humans, we have the ability to come up with complex ideas. So um, we're going to use that fact that we have brains that we can come up with complex ideas to, to try and pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and remove the, the cloak of the, of the math from some of these things. And um, at the risk of offending textbook authors, I guess, uh, I'm going to try and present stuff in that way. So back to this. So starting with the center of mass, you guys can see the slide, right? We cannot. No, we not, cannot. Not see the slide. Why can't you see the slide? About now. Yeah. yeah. Ah, there oh, we go. Okay. okay, so center of mass. So this is a pretty easy concept. I think almost all of you, I w at least would hope, pretty much all of you could tell me what this was before you came today. Um, but the center of mass, just for, for sake of clarity, is the average location of all of the mass of an object. And I put rigid in there just because we are, we are still talking in statics land where we're, we took a step out of mechanics for now. Um, but 
the same thing applies for mechanics. So it's the average location of all of the mass of a rigid object. Um, and then the centroid, you might hear these interchangeably, and I'm sure I'll say them interchangeably talking today, but the center of mass is the same thing as a centroid, except the centroid is the center of area. So, I mean, this is, this is something we've all probably been able to do for a long time. So if I take some rectangle and I say its length is 10 inches and its width is 4 inches, and I said, all right, I have, I'm just going to plop that bottom corner on my axes here. I bet all of you could tell me where the center of mass or where the centroid of this rectangle is. Right? It's right smack dab in the middle. So, you know, we intuitively can see, okay, the middle... The middle of the stuff, right? The average location in the x direction is at two inches. And the average location in the y direction is at four inches. So we would say the centroid is at location two, four. Right? Easy, simple. So now with complex shapes. Well, now we have to start actually using those brains that we have. So, oh. That's not quite straight. Let's draw that a little straighter. There we go. So here's my axes, just because axes are always a fun thing to draw. So if I have some shape, let's say it looks like this. Like that. And we got a little hole over here. So we'll give this a radius. Say it's two centimeters. This one, a radius. Say it's one centimeter. Oh dear. We'll do it out here. Radius one centimeter. Say this is eight. That one six. Give that a, we'll call it two and two. So, now we have a more complicated shape where you can't directly see where the center is, um, but I'm sure all of us can can intuit how to get there. So the, the best way that we get there, um, or at least the way that I'm going to go by, is um, you, you, find, you first find the centers of mass of all the pieces, and then you find the center of mass of the whole thing. So um, we can split this into three pieces, right? We'll say... We have one piece here, and then another piece here, and a negative piece here. So I'll, f I'll fill this in because technically it's a, a negative area. But okay, so now we have a rectangle, easy peasy. We can see the center of that one. Um, this would be, what is that, four inches. This would be three inches. Um, then this one is two. So we'd say... The, the center for a circle is at, what, what would that be? Cosine two, so that's gonna be, um, it's gonna be at four pi, oh, sorry, yeah, four r over three pi, yeah, there we go. Four times two over three pi, and well, it's a half circle, so we know this one's right in the center. So radius is 2, so that's a 2. So, um, oh, and then I guess we'll say for this, right smack dive in the middle of that guy. Um, so we have the locations of all the centers of these. Now we need to take a weighted average to add them all together, right? So this, this has some area, so let's go ahead and do that over here. So our half circle as an area of uh, pi r squared, so pi times 2 squared over 2. Our rectangle is 8 times 6, and our little circle here is pi times 1 squared. I'm going to say that this is negative pi times 1 squared, just to keep that so that we recognize that that's a whole. We're actually taking away material there rather than adding it. Um, so, for each of the directions, I'm just going to do the x direction, um, but you could follow the same process for the y. For each of the directions, we 
we multiply the uh, each of these weights, you can think of the uh, the area here as a weight, or literally, if if it's all the same thickness, it would be the weight um, times the location that it's at. So here we said that's a two. So got that times two plus that times four, right? Four there plus this times would that be seven, right? Radius one or offset of two. So this would be times six. Six. Sum those together. And oh I should have grabbed my calculator out. Let's see. We've got I times four plus forty-eight times four minus I six is one eighty five point seven one. And who can tell me what's wrong with this number? Nobody thinks there's something wrong with that number? I'll give you a hint. There is something wrong. So the answer is, because I guess, I guess we've all got the, the scaredy zooms. The um, answer is that if, if we said this was our center location for x... Well, that means that we're saying the center is way out here in, you know, off the screen at 185.7. That's not right. So because this is a weighted average, we have to divide by the total area at the end. So the total area here is 57.42. Then that ends up being 3.23. So 3.23 centimeters. Okay, that makes more sense. So if the center of our rectangle is at 4... Oh, I guess I, I went from inches to centimeters, didn't I? Whoops. Well, we'll go back to, to inches because I guess I wrote inches down. So if the center of our rectangle is at four inches and we have a little bit of mass of extra mass here and some missing mass over here, well then yeah, that, that conceivably that makes sense. If we're if we're about three and a quarter, yeah, I think that sounds like that looks like if I were to hold my finger under that thing, that'd be about where the center of mass would be. Um, so this is 3.23. And again, for the y direction, right, we do the same thing. And the same rules would apply. So um, we'd have a little more to the top because we've got this big mass over here and a little less to the bottom. Um, so it'd probably be, oh, I don't know, if I had to guess, probably somewhere around 3.4-ish. So yeah, so we'd end up, end up there. And again, I think most of us probably understood how to calculate this before coming today. But uh, this concept, this idea of adding things up, um, adding things up incrementally is where we're going to go to next. So the whole point of engineering is we want to be able to do this for every shape. So we want to be able to do this for funky shapes. So if I, if I have some, I don't know, some rocket part that is just off the wall, crazy looking. It's the, the weirdo part of science, right? Looks like this. Well, I want to figure out what the center of mass is for this weirdo part of science. And actually, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and erase these. We're going to erase these uh, axes, make it a little harder. Because otherwise, if I put them at the center, pretty obviously in the center. So we've got. One axis there, one axis here, and I want to figure out what is the location of my centroid or my center of mass. Typically, centroids are drawn like this, um, with each of these corners filled in. Um, depending on how much you guys have done with SolidWorks, you might have actually come across this, or just in general, you might have seen the the center of mass symbol. Um, but we've got to use some calculus to figure out where this is. If we go back to this previous slide, um, we went, okay, well, we've got, each, we've got each thing 
located at a certain distance, but we want to take the weighted sum of all those things. So if I, if, I, if I go the calculus route, well, we know we're going to break stuff up into differential masses um, or differential areas. So uh, for the x component, we're going to, I'll just do the x component for now. Um, but we'll say, okay, we've got some little sliver of this guy and we'll call that we'll call that the 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 differential area x and we've got some distance that this is away from the y axis but remember this is in the x direction so we call this x bar this is our our distance to this to this little slice of our of our thing here we want to take the sum we want the sum of all of them divided by or the sum of each of them divided by the sum of all of them so we say that the the centroid location x bar equals the sum of the little x bar so we'll in, in I'll instead of x bar typically use x bar for the average I'll just call this x um, for whatever our our differential piece is so the sum of x ooh, oops wrong size sum of x the x location of the thing that we're talking about right now so d a x so this uh, this little sliver here we can that's, it has a length, which if you take the derivative of area, you get length, right? Over the total area. So the, the, the integral of the derivative of area, same thing as the area, right? So we get x bar, which is the location, the x location of our centroid. So the, oh, that there is x bar, is the sum of the x location of each of our little slices divided by the total area. And we take the, this is a weighted sum, right? So here's our weight, here's our, our distance, and here's our total. So now we have a convenient way to calculate the center of mass for any shape. Um, and a lot of times we say, well, we're engineers. We, we don't have time to do calculus. We need to understand how it works, but I don't, I don't care about that. That's too much work. So we use charts. Um, so a lot of times you'll see charts like this that have, um, that give you equations for the locations of each of these things. Um, and typically we, we use standard shapes too. So, um, so if I were to just go to this chart for, uh, for this funky shape we had earlier, I could say, okay, well, I've got a, a half circle here. So I know where this one is. In fact, that's exactly how I did it. I just looked at the chart in my notes. Um, here we've got a we got a circle. I mean, we, I think we all know the centroid of a circle is. And here we've got a rectangle, and it, which again isn't in this chart because we all know you can all intuit where the center of a rectangle is. We multiply them, right? We we take the sum of each individual weight times each individual distance. And then we divide that by the total weight or area, right? The, the equations are still the, the same. We're just talking about either a mass or an area. And that'll tell us the average location for the whole thing. So um, this will be the center of mass. Um, so if you're talking about mass, right? Typically, we think of mass as this thing that everything has it's just innately the it's what stuff is right it's it's what stuff has well not really what mass is is stuff's resistance to gravity okay so bear bear with me here because this uh this definition will go forward so matter matter right saying that that has a lot of matter well Matter is like the stuff, right? A photon is a particle. It is matter. It doesn't have any mass, but it is matter, right? It's a thing that exists. 
you could argue that an antiphoton or a uh, an anti-electron, which would be a positron, even though it has hardly any mass, the only reason that we the only reason that we say it has mass is because gravity does have some effect on it. So for this purpose, I'm going to define mass. Say mass is a resistance. Oh, oh boy. Let's go back to small font for this. Say resistance to acceleration. And I said gravity earlier, um, but any any mass can be a, uh, accelerated, right? Yeah, uh, if you have if you have a force on you from the side, right? The whole point of statics is that there's more forces than just gravity. But a force, by definition, is something that acts on a mass. It accelerates a mass by a certain amount. So, well, uh, we can we can go further. So. We, we already know what forces are. Now, let's talk about moments. So, uh, I, I can say a centroid is the average location of the average location of the, the mass of an object. Well, what we can do is we can say, what if I wanted to know something about how this object rotates? So, you can think of the first mom moment or the first area moment, as the average resistance of a body to being rotated. Um, so if we have, uh, we have our, our weird funky body again, we'll just draw it over here. Um, let's say its centroid is about there. Up there like that. If I'm trying to rotate this object, if I'm trying to push it this way, um, the stuff that's farther away from the middle, the stuff that's farther away from the center, is going to have more resistance to being rotated than the stuff that's in the middle. Uh, think of a door, right? If you, if you have a door, we put the handle of the door out here rather than right on the inside. I'm assuming that the hinges are there. So the reason we put the handle of the door out here is because we can apply more force, or we can, for the same force, we can apply it way out here uh, in order to swing the thing. Um, at the same time, right, if, if all that was in a door was a teeny tiny amount of stuff, if the, we had the same amount of mass as a, in a door, but we shoved it all up here, well, it'd be a lot easier to rotate it. It's a lot easier to twist a... Uh, a lot easier to twist a steering wheel than it is to twist some little ax some little i don't know some little steering rod right you the whole reason for using a moment is that we give ourselves more distance a bigger lever arm with which to turn that stuff so if a mass is a resistance to being to being accelerated a a first area moment is a resistance to being rotated um, so let's let's do this with a basic shape. Uh, so let's let's do this with just a rectangle. So if I have a rectangle, I'm gonna put my put my axes on here again. I want to figure out how much stuff is there and at what distance is it away from the axis I'm trying to rotate it around. Um, and by that logic. Uh, the more the more stuff I have, and the farther away it is from my from my axis, the harder it's going to be to rotate. So we'll we'll use this door. We'll use this door as our example. So uh, we know where the centroid is for the from the door, right? Right, right smack dab in the middle. We know the distance to that centroid. Oh, oh there's here distance to the centroid x bar we know the mass of the whole door so we know the the mass or the area of the whole door we'll call that a um and well now we we need some way to combine the two we need to say okay if i have more more distance that we want this quantity to go up if we have 
more stuff. We want this quantity to go up. Um, simple plot, right? More stuff up, more distance up. Well, we can say that the first area moment, usually we call it Q, is just the distance times the amount of stuff. And again, right, in, in reality, a door, you would never think of a door as having a first area moment. This is really just some useful math tool. It's just some way for us to take some numbers and combine them so we can talk about them in other cases. But, but I mean, you can, you can kind of see, right, how, how this would be useful. If I, if I uh, you can think of like a merry-go-round, right, or, or those, uh, those theme park swings that swing in and out. Right, the closer I am to the middle of a, of uh, something like of uh, I'm going to use those theme park swings. Those are a little more fun. The closer you are to the middle of those theme park swings, you could also do this with yourself in a rolly chair, or if you if you spin yourself in a spinny chair, right, and then you pull your arms in, you'll spin faster because you've reduced you've reduced the resistance to yourself being rotated. So you move faster because there's now less resistance to the rotation. Um, this is a, a way for us to quantify that. So we've taken the mass that was out here, we moved it closer to the axis, and now, now we can do things with it. Now we can talk about it. So um, we can do this with complex shapes as well. So again, it's the same thing. So we take our, take our, our complex shape. Um, we know, okay, the, the distance to this one. We know the distance to that one. We know the distance to that one. And we know the area of this, the area of this, and the negative, the negative area of that. And all we have to do is sum them up again. We take the sum of this times this. And that gives us Q. And those of you that were paying attention to the equations on the last side will probably see that, oh, this is just the same thing as the center of mass, right? This is just X bar. Oh, not X. There we go. This is the same thing as X bar times the area, right? Because instead of dividing by the area at the end, we just move it to the other side of the equation. So for funky shapes, Again, same thing. We, we use our wonderful friend calculus that we hate so dearly. And we say, okay, I've got this weird funky shape. For every single little piece of x, for every single little slice of my shape, I can say what its distance is. I can say what its differential area, aka length in this case, is. And I can, from there, take the sum of them. Um, some of you might have seen this before, but the the uppercase S in an integral is literally means summation. It means sum all of them. It has a connotation of having a lot of little pieces, but you could technically just have an integral sign that has a bunch of individual points under it. It's just that it's it's a little more formal, a little better better way to talk about it um, since we're not using discrete points, since we're actually using a continuous function. But yeah, it's just the sum of the x's times the differential area. And that gives us the, the uh, I guess I should put an x on there. That gives us the first moment. So if, a, if the first moment is the sum of this thing that resists a force times its distance, well, then what's a better way to think about that in terms of something that we already know. So uh, one, one nice way to think about this is with distributed loads. Uh, so if we take, I'm just going to do a triangular distributed load. Do a, a nice long distributed load. Looks something like this. Boom, boom, boom. We'll say that it this is the maximum low is W star. Uh, we'll say that this has some equation just W of X. And it's linear, so it's a pretty easy equation. Um, and 
it has it's distributed over some length length l so when we have distributed loads a lot of times we want to convert them into something that's more appealing uh so in in let's see what was it two or four six weeks ago i don't know some time ago uh, we discovered that, well, we can talk about this distributed load as actually being a force that applies at some distance. So we can say, okay, well, rather than, rather than thinking about this as a whole, a whole big sum of things, we do our, our fancy calculus trick, and we say, okay, this is equivalent, this is functionally equivalent to having some force, some force W, apply it at some distance, X. And I think you might be able to see where I'm going with this. So x bar times w equals the integral of x dw, right? Um, for this case, for this case, x bar is one third so times the length. So x bar equals l over three. Um, we can go back to our chart here, and we can we can derive this directly from our chart. We say y bar is h over three. So uh, from from bottom to top of a triangle, your your location of your centroid is at a third of its height. Here's the same thing. So the location of our centroid going from bottom to top on this triangle is a third of its length. And let me let me draw the. Uh, I'll draw this kind of as a ghost behind it. Um, we can say that the force, the total force from this distributed load, W, equals uh, W star, W star, minus W star over L times X. And this is the same thing as W star times L over two. That's right, for a distributed load, the total force of your whole distributed load is just the area of this thing. Area of a, rec area of a triangle, uh, base times height over two. <coughs> so we can think of this here, right? A first moment is just, all it's doing is telling us how this, distributed load looks if we were to simplify it uh, by the same vein right if we take a centroid all a centroid is telling us is okay we have this body we have this body that's some weird shape or could be a, just some normal shape just this thing and we don't want to we don't want to work with this thing as it stands we want to work in we want to reduce the work that we have to do so we simplify this shape as if it were just one thing that existed at, at the location of its centroid. So we just want to say, okay, this is equivalent, and I, I should actually, actually write this formally, right? The whole point of doing this, the whole point of even using the center of mass is so that we can treat something equivalent as just a little piece, a little tiny mass located at the centroid. Um, so now that we have a way of talking about of talking about how much there is of something, where it is, that's our center, that's our centroid or our center of mass. Then we want to say, okay, how much can we rotate it with respect to that? So then we have our f first moment. So our first moment can tell us uh, can tell us how to get to the centroid, but now we want some way of being able to describe, okay, if I have this, if I have this little point mass here located at this place, how can I deal with it on the outside? So the first moment is good for, it's good to use for adding stuff up, but it's not normalized. It'd be like if we didn't have, if we didn't have our definition of strain if we just had forces uh then we could never talk about we could never or sorry not strain stress we could never compare these things so 
right? That, that big number that we had earlier, this 185.71, this is kind of a meaningless number, right? It, it's not related to any of our units. It's just, it's really big. It, it doesn't make much sense, right? This is a much more, a much easier to digest number. It's a number that actually means something. And the whole point here, the whole point of doing this is that we have something that's useful to us. So, uh, as the same as force is to area, or the force over area is to strain, we can think about the first moment, first moment Q of X. We do something to it in order to get a rotation, or a tendency not to rotate. So, what we're going to do is take the moment of it. So we find the moment of the moment. Uh, this is a really stupid definition because it's kind of meaningless, but I'll 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 get to it in a second. We'll we'll explain it a little better. Um, so the this is also called the moment of inertia. Uh, typically, the reason here is when you're dealing with this quantity, this this useful math tool that we're going to explore how to use, uh, you care about the inertia of something. Uh, inertia isn't something we've really talked about yet because we've been in the world of statics. In statics, nothing has inertia because nothing's moving. It is by definition static, or at least nothing's accelerating, right? You could have constant velocity and still solve something with statics. But, so we want to talk about our, how can we move something? So, as mass is to force, right? Mass is a resistance to a force. Moment of inertia is to a moment. So, moment of inertia is something that's talking about a mass and a distance with, uh, and we want to be able to describe something as having more resistance to a moment than something else. Uh, the, one of the nice things about moments is a moment is inherently a three-dimensional object. Um, so a moment is something that just, it doesn't exist in fewer dimensions than that, right? You could have, you could say you're in one, one dimension, right? We're on a number line and we have a thing and that thing exists here, but we can only say where it is. Well, we could, we could give ourselves two dimensions. So we have one dimension that talks about where it is. We say where it is here. We can, we can say it exists here, but it also it also has some mass. There's some amount of stuff there. So we have some other quantity, right? Some other axis here that we can describe how much stuff actually exists at that location. So mass by by this analogy would be a, a something that is inherently two dimensional. You have to have more than one way to describe it. Now, a moment is something that is inherently three-dimensional. So, in, in a plane now, we can say, okay, I, I exist here. I have one dimension in X and one dimension in Y. And then I can also change, and we'll make this, we'll make this something that we can actually see how it rotates. Because, you know, if you're rotating a particle, you can't really tell. But we want to say, okay, now I can change my orientation within this two-dimensional space, um, and I have some way to describe how much I do that. So that's why we typically think of moments as acting in the Z direction. So we think of moments as actually being some quantity in this third dimension. Right. When you, when you do statics, uh, at least when you start off in statics, you talk about it in 2D. And a lot of times we do stuff in two dimensions just because uh, it's a lot simpler, right? We don't have to worry about, we don't have to worry about doing all sorts of complicated geometry or, or yeah, I guess geometry or trigonometry. Um, but this act of rotating something, the amount that we can do that, well, we have to express that some way outside of the plane. Um, but because we can do that, we, we can express it in each dimension. So there's a tendency, there's a tendency to, uh, for a center of mass, right? We can say a center of mass is located 
I'll, I'll draw it in green. Center of mass is located here. So in our, in our two-dimensional area, we can describe it with two different numbers. We can say it's in the x-direction, it's in the y-direction. But we can do the same thing with the moment of inertia. We can say, okay, I want to rotate this way. So I have to sum up all of the things that are preventing me from rotating that way. I can have something pointing it, a force in that direction or a force in that direction. As long as it's separated by some distance from my centroid, it still contributes to the total amount of resisting that, uh, resisting that rotation. So just like we have an X bar, an X bar and a Y bar, we have, uh, we have moments in both directions, or we have moments of inertia, sorry. We have moments of inertia in both directions. So in the X direction, we call this I, X, X. In the Y direction, we call this I, Y, Y. Uh, these, these directions are a bit confusing at first. Um, next week, we'll get on to the inertia tensor, and you guys will see um, hopefully you'll you'll be able to see how uh, how this nomenclature kind of comes about. What what makes it uh, why why we use two subscripts instead of just one. Um, but at the end of the day, right? This is not necessarily a real thing, right? We can talk about it as you know it's a resistance of a thing to be rotated, and the more the farther I am away. And the more stuff there is away, the more likely, or the, the more resistance I'm going to have to rotating something. Um, so just keep that, keep that in the back of your mind for now. Um, I'm not going to introduce the equation yet um, for moment of inertia. I'll, I'll do that next week. Uh, but keep that idea in your mind. Kind of chew on it. Kind of think about it. Um, when you're opening doors over the next week, you know, open a door from the handle where we put it, you can tell, okay, I can, I can rotate this stuff pretty easily from out here. And then try and rotate it from the inside. Try and rotate it around the hinge. You'll find it's a huge pain. Actually a good, uh, good wrist workout if you're trying to do that. Um, but one thing I will do today, because I think we've still got time, yeah, we've still got a little bit of time, is talk about the radius of gyration. So a lot of times this is something that's talked about purely as a math tool um but there's there's some element of it that's actually almost easier to think about than a moment of inertia so because it collapses the moment of inertia from two dimensions down to one dimension so rather than two numbers that we have to keep track of to, to ask how is this thing going to rotate it's just one number um so the radius of gyration is the radius at which a body has the same moment of inertia as if it was shaped like a ring or like a hula hoop with the same mass. Um, this is a lot of times something you use in approximations or in testing things. So let's, let's kind of dive into that explanation. So if I've got, I'm going to draw this in three dimensions because I think it, it starts to be easier to see in three dimensions. So I've got some, uh, I've got some block here we'll just say uh we'll just say it's a we'll just say it's a tube uh like a cardboard tube right i had a bunch of wrapping paper i took all the wrapping paper off um so when i'm going to to bonk somebody on the head with this i'm gonna swing it down i, I hold it like this i'm gonna swing it down i actually have to calculate our brains subconsciously calculate the amount of force, the, the moment required to accelerate this thing such that you bonk your, I don't know, your, your little sister who, or whom, whomever you're bonking today uh, with a, some amount of force, right? We want to accelerate this thing uh, rotationally. So we'll, we'll call this alpha. At, and alpha is our um, angular angular acceleration um so it's it's kind of hard to think about well i have this tube but it's shaped kind of weird and i don't know what i would do to 
to like th rotate this tube, right? I, I, I'm going to have to somehow figure out where all of the mass is with, re with respect to some axis, and uh, that doesn't make much sense. Um, and we'll, we'll get there eventually where we can do that, but it'll, it'll take some more math. But what if instead of a tube, what if I just said, okay, uh, let's, let's change the place I'm holding it to the center, um, just for simplicity's sake, because uh, this will make it a little easier to think about. So if I hold this tube at the center, well, it's pretty easy to think about rotating a wheel, right? You have a wheel... And I want to rotate a wheel. Well, the harder I push, because there's only one place I can push, right? There's just, there's just at the radius of the wheel. If I push on this wheel with some force, it's going to rotate a little bit. If I push at it with a lot of force, it'll rotate more. If I pull on it, it'll rotate the other direction. Um, and we can, we can say, okay, so now, now we've kind of collapsed this down a dimension. We say, okay, I no longer have to worry about my radius. I no longer have to worry about how far away I am from the center when I'm thinking about rotating this thing. I just need to know how much stuff there is that I have to rotate and what this radius is. And this radius is what we call the radius of gyration. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the definition of gyration is, uh, but I would... I would venture a guess that it is uh, to gyrate something. I mean, you can gyrate your hips, right? You call that a rotation of the hips, right? It's a, a radius at which we can rotate something or we can cause something to rotate. So if I take this tube, I, I want to I wanna roll up the tube. So we roll up our tube, roll it up like that. We'll roll it up into a circle, and then we'll squish it together. Squish it together there. And then we end up with this ring. So now this ring, I can I can say, oh, this is really easy. I just have to I just have to pull this hard on that on a, on this ring in order to get it to rotate. Um and this is especially helpful for really weirdly shaped stuff. Um so you might have uh you might have a gear. Right, a gear, for example, has all these teeth on here, and sure, we could figure out, uh, we could figure out the area of each tooth. We could figure out the uh, how many teeth there are. Generally, we 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 would think, okay, it's probably around the center. If we have an even number of teeth, that is true. If we have an odd number of teeth, it's technically not. Um, but we'll we'll ignore that for for a second here. Um, but what if we had what if we had some other gears? So if we took the gears in the Baja, in, the, in our gearbox, for example, they have these arms that come off the side, or off the inside, that support the, um, that support the ring on the outside. And these have just some weird, crazy geometry, right? I would spend so much time trying to, trying to get all the arcs in here, trying to measure it. Um, and even, even then, right? Let's say it, it comes, off the, comes off the CNC, and, well, I've got a tolerance on these arcs, but it could, be, it could be a little bit over in some places, could be a little under in some places. It could be not quite circular, right? It could be kind of shaped like that, where we can't directly measure it. But what we can do, we, we still have a way of figuring out how much is this thing going to rotate. All we have to do... We put it on some axis, we rotate it, we accelerate it, and then we, f we, uh, we see with some force what our angular acceleration is. So we apply some force, we figure out what our ac acceleration is. Um, this, the equation, so I think, I've, I think I've talked your ears off enough as to kind of what this means. Uh, the equation here, we have the moment of inertia uh, in whatever direction is equivalent to the radius of gyration squared. Oh, that should be an x. Radius of gyration squared times the area. So if we take if we take our resistance to being rotated, we apply apply a moment, right? 
apply a force at a distance. Um, we can think of that as the opposite of a resistance. If we're, if we're pushing on something, it's the opposite of pulling on something. Then we normalize it by the area. So we normalize it by the area. F I, I by the area. Then what we want to do is take the square root of that because when we compressed this, when we when we folded this thing up and moved it in, um, we we actually did some funky Pythagorean stuff, uh, which I in no terms uh, explained and don't expect you to either understand or buy just yet. But we said, okay, if I uh, if I have a triangle, right, hypotenuse is, uh, uh, what's a hypotenuse? H squared equals X squared plus Y squared. So that's, that's the only reason we have this square in here is because we're, we're taking something that was two components and we're, we're treating it as a hypotenuse. So that is how we get to the radius of gyration. And next week i know i'm leaving it on a cliffhanger and there's probably a lot of a lot of open questions but next week we'll dive deeper into exactly exactly how to solve for the the moment of inertia or the second moment and that'll hopefully give away where this square comes from and also uh we'll we'll then be able to talk about things rotating and we'll talk about be able to talk about rotational inertia rotational um, accelerations. So, today, this is the end of the day. Today we covered, let's get all the way back to it. So today we got through centers of mass. We started to tease moments of inertia. Um, after next week, um, yeah, it, it probably won't end up being next week. It'll probably be a couple weeks in the future. We'll get on to products of inertia and the inertia tensor. Um, and once we once we know how to solve for moments of inertia, these ideas fall out pretty well. They um, they 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 become pretty easy to understand. Um, and for those of you that are interested, this these two things actually usually aren't even introduced until intermediate. Um, but I think I think learning about them now, or at least being exposed to them now, um, can help you get a lot more comfortable with the idea before you actually have to do the the intermediate dynamics uh classwork which is just mind-boggling and really fun but it'll it'll throw you for a loop but anyway that's it for today